God has a plan for marriage. And I've discovered that every time we follow God's plan, it always works. There are positively no exceptions to that. And there are three kinds of marriages. There are bad marriages. There are okay marriage, okay marriages. And there are great marriages. If you're not married, what kind of marriage would you like to have? If you are married, what kind of marriage would you like to have? So we have to decide. And so God, in his clarity, people always say, a lot of the Bible don't understand. That's not your problem. The problem that you and I have, the Bible is the part we do understand. So it's very clear. God has given us a, a formula, a design, a dream, a way in which a marriage, marriages can be all that he designed for them to become. And so we look back and see the essential relationship. There's no other human relationship that is greater than marriage. Certainly our relationship with God and Jesus Christ would be first, but marriage is absolutely there. Nobody here as humans will make a more profound, important decision in your life by saying, I do and I will, I now pronounce you, that has preeminence over everything else. So let's just look back and see the history a little bit. Let's go to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter number one tells us what God did. In the beginning, God let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be. And he had seven let there be's, and he said every time it is good, and the seventh one, he said, it is very good. And then we see the beautiful, beautiful story. And God said, it's not good for man to be alone, and Adam says, I sure get that said, I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, the females get upset at the word helper, but the word helper in the Hebrew means that something is missing. It's the rest of that which should be there. That's a better translation. Not some subservient. It is, it is something that will be there. It's something that, that is missing. And then he said, I will make a helper, that part that is missing. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground of the wild animals and all the birds of the sea, and he brought them to the man to see. He would name them and whatever the man called the living creatures, that was the name. And so the man gave the name to all the livestock and the birds and the sky and the wild animals. But Adam, no suitable helper, the rest of something, was found. So the Lord God called man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib. He had taken out a man, and he brought her to man, and Adam said, notice God brought that woman to man. Ladies, God brought your husband to you. Men, God brought your wife to you. Same thing. The man said, Eureka, that's the rest of me. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman. By the way, what is the purpose of all this, of creation, all the universe? What, what is the purpose of all the animals? 
What, what is the, the climax of all this magnificence that has come into being? Ex nihilo, out of nothing, God's creative act. What is the purpose? Here it is. Guess what? Marriage. Marriage. You say, well, I'll doubt that. Then you don't know your Bible. Marriage, we've already discovered, begins right here in Genesis 1. Ends up the marriage feast of the land in Revelation, right? And we know this particular plan for marriage is repeated in the Bible by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, Matthew 18. He comes back and deals with it again in Ephesians 5. And all the way through the Bible, there's marriage and marriage and marriage and marriage and marriage. Now, those of you who are single, just hold on. We're not going to cover every relationship. We'll get to that very clearly what that role is. So don't get bent out of joint. We're talking about relationships and the highest and most sacred and beautiful and magnificent relationship God has given to us is marriage. And we can follow the, the formula, the plan, and the design. And when we do, guess what? It works every single time. I was speaking last night and I got carried away. And I said, look, if anybody who is married follows this formula, both partners or Christians, and your marriage doesn't sing and work and soar, I will personally go find $100,000 and write you a check. So you'll make some quick money. And I wish I could say a million or 10 million because I am confident I know beyond words. So you can have a, a bad marriage, an okay marriage, or you can have a great marriage that God designed. You say, well, I, I bounce between one and one. No, no, no. Uh, under the great marriage doesn't mean everything is always uh, violins and roses. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying your marriage will be bountiful and beautiful and growing and significant, and it will be the center point of your life if we do it God's way. Now, we have to decide. Some people said, well, it's too late for me. No, it's not. Not by God's grace and by God's power. So what is this formula? Let's look at it. It's right here. She shall be taken out of man, and that is why a man leaves his father and his mother. The first thing we have to do, we have to leave. We have to leave your parents. You see? Leave father, leave your mother. But what does that mean? It means in marriage there has to be an exclusivity. It's an exclusive thing. It's a private thing. It's, it's you and me, babe. Exclusivity is a part of it. You leave. What does it mean to leave? You leave your parents, all other relationships, you have your parents, you have other relationships, but the number one relationship, there's nothing challenges it. So you have to leave the financial support you have for your parents. Hello? Doesn't mean parents do not help, but it means that parents back up and let those married children begin to fend for themselves as early as possible. You back up and let them decide. Don't make that house payment. Don't buy that car. That'd be my recommendation. Back up. Let there be some struggle. Let there be some discipline financially. Don't overtake that. There is exceptions here for a while, but that is what we must do as parents, as grandparents. Back up. Back up. You have to back up emotionally. I heard a marriage tape this week. I just flipped it in. And the story was told that this young couple got married. Boy, they were having a great time. It was perfect. It was Ken and Barbie, and the bells were ringing. They had everything going for them. And then they were married about six months, and they had their first real fight. Not physically, but the first real debate. And I'm telling you, it went from bad to worse, and 
She said, I didn't know you when I married you. And he said, I didn't realize you were like this. And they call old things, old grudges, old ideas. And it goes on and on. And she gets hysterical as she's crying. And, and females, I want you to know your tears are like uh, nuclear weapons at this time. And, and she's crying. She's hysterical. And they go on and on. And it gets worse and worse. And I don't know how we can live together. We didn't make it. Let's get out of here. It gets overwhelming until finally he said, I'm out of here. And he gets up and goes out and closes the door and starts walking up the street. And she's just outrageously upset. And she goes and gets a, puts on a robe over her gown and gets on some shoes and gets in the car and backs out of the car and takes off down the road and sees him walking and doesn't even look left or right. And she's going home, though her mother and dad live about Two hours from her, she's going home to mama. She takes off. She gets there about, oh, 4 a.m. in the morning, knowing her mother gets up early. She's still crying. She goes to the front door. She rings the bell. She rings the bell, banging on the door, mama, mama, mama. Her mother comes to the door and pulls that little, you know, the little screen, the little curtains back and looks at her and, Closes it and, oh, let me in, mother. It's all. And she, mother, pulls it back, looks at her again, closes it. She's still hysterical on the porch, and the mother goes and cracks the door and puts her foot in it and says, You've had your first fight, haven't you? Oh, yes, mother. She says, Go home and make it right. Bang, close the door. That was it. <laughs> About 10 or 12 years went by. This couple's marriage was just blossoming. And she told a friend, you know, the best thing that ever happened in my marriage was when my mother slammed the door and said, go home and make it right. You see, there's an exclusivity in marriage an exclusivity in marriage. So we got to watch all the financial support. We've got to cut away the emotional support and realize that God has put you together and you have the ability, particularly and especially if you're in Christ, to go through every single crisis. Number one, leave. There is an exclusivity there that we must honor. First principle. The next principle in here, I want you to look at it very accurately here in the account. It says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother because of marriage. And he says, and is united with his wife and they become one flesh. That's singularity. In other words, two become one. And when this happens, here is the kingdom of self meeting the kingdom of self. Here's the kingdom of the male meeting the kingdom of the female, and you mean they are to become one? And so many times there is a kingdom battle that goes on for a long, long time, not understanding that both kingdoms are to be dissolved and destroyed, and now they're to have one kingdom that is operating in marriage under the very kingdom of God. You see, two becoming one is a tremendous challenge. But when it happens, it is a magnificently beautiful thing to observe. Do you know the most powerful witness for Christ that anybody here can make, myself included, is to see when two become one, they become one flesh, and that's where we would say gorilla glue or super glue comes into being. And we're so intertwined with one another in every way, in every attitude, in every situation. And that marriage that is alive for God and Christ is the most powerful witness we can give to the world. There's nothing more powerful than that. To see a couple that's got it, that's glowing, it's a beautiful thing. 
that intertwineness. There, there's no secret agendas. There, there's nothing hidden there. There's nothing that the other one doesn't know. And there's no areas you can't talk about. Well, we can talk about everything but sex and finances. Oh, no. Two become one. And the reason we have so many tragic divorces, when people have been married for a long time and there's that empty nest, is because they wake up and said, who is this woman? Who is this man? In the process of child rearing and raising and bringing them up, they got where they didn't know each other and they didn't give the highest priority to one another. It was the children, it was the job, it was other people, it was hobbies, it was activities. And they wake up and therefore they say, I'm not gonna live the rest of my life with him or her. Bang, they're out of here. It happens all the time. Two become one. What a beautiful thing. Two become one, operating with the very principles of God in Jesus Christ. It works every time. It is a powerful witness to this world. Let's say, boy, what do they have that we don't have? What do they see? It's because there is an exclusivity there. It's because now there's a singularity there. And that is a magnificent thing and almost a rare thing in the culture in which we live. Because some of us, who even are Christians, we use the Bible as a hammer. Oh, yeah, oh, you don't know the Bible like this. And we, we call out the Word of God as if it's a sledgehammer to win some kind of argument. We try to, some wives or husbands, try to outpious one another. You know, in a situation like that, Oh, yeah, I do. I've seen it many times. There was a couple that got married, newlyweds. Both of them were Christians. And so the Bible teacher that the man had sat under for many years asked this young guy, just married, how are things going with your marriage? He said, well, she's having a tough time following my leadership. She's not really submissive to my leadership. And so the Bible teacher says, well, show me that verse in the Bible. He said, my goodness, you mean you don't know that verse? You've been teaching me the Bible all these years? You don't know that verse? He said, no, show me the verse that says that your wife is to submit your leadership. He said, well, it's right here. And he went and got his Bible out of his desk. And he said, I want to read it to you. It's in Ephesians. You know it. Chapter number 22, it says, wives, submit the Bible. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you say? It says, wives, submit. She said, no, no, that verse is not for you. Didn't you say it began with wives? Did you notice that? Oh, he said. He said, look at some of those verses that are for you. He got the Bible. He said, look here. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word. He said, it sounds like a husband should be willing to die and should be living a death-defying life in the presence of the wife, doesn't it? It sure does. Christ died for, oh, that's how the husband's live, a sacrificial, a crucified life to please the wife. Oh. said, so here's another verse that's for you. Look at verse 28. In this very same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Oh, he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for the body. Oh, ho, oh, that's for you. And said, by the way, while you're talking about biblical principles of marriage, did you notice that all these job assignments for the husband and the wife begin with this verse? Look at this. He read to him, verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It all begins with wives submitting to their husband, the husband submitting to their wives. That's the preamble before you have the specific assignments given to the husband and wife. So remember we talked about that. We position ourselves under. We position us under. The husband positions himself under the wife. The wife positions himself under the husband. You see what I'm talking about? God's formula really works, folks. It cuts across pride and ego. It cuts across my desires, your desires, and the number one thing in life you don't want 
the kingdom of self versus the kingdom of self. You want the kingdom of selflessness operating in that marriage, in that home, in that relationship. Did anybody ever have a marital debate or dispute on the basis of, well, you're not being treated fairly. It was all the disputes come, I'm not getting what I deserve. I'm not getting what ought to be here. It's self. And when a marriage begins to increasingly, increasingly become selflessness, powerful things take place. This is not my idea. Don't say, well, I don't agree with the preacher. It had nothing to do with me. It's just God's word. You can take it and throw it out and not believe it, or you can put it into practice, and fire will come into your marriage, guaranteed every single time. So we leave. Your marriage, my marriage becomes a touch of exclusivity. Man, it's, 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 we leave. We become one. There's singularity. No hidden agendas, nothing backward, nothing back there. We deal, we talk about it all, and we become one. And then finally, look at the last part. And this has to do with transparency. Adam and Eve were both naked, and they felt no shame. Isn't that great? Transparent. Here I am, open. Honest, with you, on your team, cheering for you, cherishing you. Transparency. What would it be like to live in a family where everybody always told the truth in love? What kind of family would that be? Well, that's the way it's going to be in heaven. We have the opportunity to have a little touch of heaven right now, folks. Just tell the truth in love. And your wife and your husband can reprogram how you see yourself and how others have, have seen you. That there's a reprogramming there. If people have said, well, you know, he's not very smart. But your wife says, hey, man, I know you've got a lot of stuff. I think you're very bright. It reprograms you. Somebody says, well, you know, you're sort of, sort of slow and you, you don't really look too sharp. Your wife says, man, you're the sharpest thing I've ever seen. Same way with the husband. We reprogram one another because there's that mirror out there in front. And we can tear down, we can build up. We can speak the truth in love and there's an open and, and a candidness. And all of a sudden, things happen in marriage. Wonderful things happen in marriage. So we got the formula there, leave, cleave, no shame, transparency. Well, how, how do we get there? Remember I talked about you, in marriage you talk, 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 you listen, 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 and you pray and pray and pray. Marriage involves work and worship, worship and work, work and worship, and when a couple genuinely begins to pray together, that marriage will soar every single time because you can't fool God. You may try to, but you can't. Now, somebody here, or many here, <coughs> would say, man, it's just too late for me. My, my, I'm, my marriage is down in a pit. It's down there. 20 feet deep. I'm going to tell you something. God has a rope that's 21 feet long. And he'll put it down in that pit. Say, well, my marriage is, we're, you don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm with my marriage and my kids, my wife. I, I'm down in a pit 1,000 feet deep. Tell you something. God has a rope that's a thousand and one foot, and he'll put it down. And I'm going to tell you something more exciting than that. He'll not only, by his grace, put that rope down for you if you're down in that pit, 
But Jesus Christ will go down that rope just like he did in Bethlehem and meet you and bring you back up so you can have a marriage that begins to flourish and grow and sing in harmony like God intends for it to do. Choices. Just keep on doing it the same old way. My marriage is okay, I'm holding on. I'm here for the kids or for family or reputation or whatever. Or, or, you can begin by his grace and by his power to do it God's way.